Hi. Welcome to the event, Boycott, Divestment and Sanctions, Building Solidarity with Palestine. Uh, thanks for joining us. And thanks to Haymarket Books for hosting this discussion. I'm Jason Farbman, uh, the Digital Director at Jewish Voice for Peace. And I'm joined today by Omar Bargudi, Stephanie Fox, and Olivia Kotby. Uh, as you likely know, Boycott, Divestment and Sanctions is a Palestinian-led movement for freedom, justice, and equality. Inspired by the South African anti-apartheid movement, the BDS call urges action to pressure Israel to comply with international law. And Israel has flaunted international law for over 75 years, but in all that time, it has perhaps never been as deadly or gruesome as it is today while we speak. To date, more than 10,000 people in Gaza have been killed. Over 4,000 Palestinian children have died since October 7th, and an additional 1,300 children are missing under the rubble. When those children are found, they will, they're presumed to be, will be found dead because Israel has attacked electricity, hospitals, and other sources that would sustain life in Gaza. And we ask, what will it take to stop this? Clearly, it will not be the US government of its own accord. Instead of doing anything to stop the Israeli military's aggression, Washington has given every indication that it will support this march to genocide. Once Congress finally got a Speaker of the House, its first order of business was a resolution declaring US support for the Israeli state. That resolution passed 412 to 10. And just this week, they formally censured Rashida Tlaib, a Palestinian Congresswoman, for the crime of agreeing with the slogan that Palestine will be free. And last Friday, the Biden administration revealed a package for the Israeli military that will send nearly $18 billion for weapons of war and military financing grants. And as we all know, US support for the Israeli state did not begin on October 7th, 2023. The United States is the most powerful military in the history of the world and has stood firmly behind Israel for decades and decades. So when we ask, what will it take to stop this? We mean the genocidal violence the Israeli military is visiting on Gaza as we speak. But we don't just mean that. We also mean 75 years of apartheid, violence, and ethnic cleansing that has been the Zionist project. And I would argue that the most successful challenge to 75 years of ethnic cleansing has come in our lifetime with the rise of the movement for boycott, divestment, and sanctions. BDS has moved the needle in this country in ways I could not have imagined 15 years ago. And that's why, in that time, the Israeli state first became terrified of BDS and then was determined to crush it by any means necessary. So to discuss the rise of the BDS movement and the critical lessons it has for us today are Omar Bargudi, Stephanie Fox, and Olivia Kotby. I'll introduce each of them now, and then we'll uh, begin asking questions and have a discussion with our panelists. Omar Bargudi is a Palestinian human rights defender and the co-founder of the Palestinian-led Boycott, Divestment, and Sanctions movement. He's a co-recipient of the 2017 Gandhi Peace Award, holds a BSc and an MSc in electrical engineering from Columbia University, and is pursuing a PhD in philosophy at the University of Amsterdam. He's the author of BDS, The Global Struggle for Palestinian Rights. Stephanie Fox, at the MPH is the executive director of Jewish Voice for Peace, a grassroots membership organization that organizes and mobilizes hundreds of thousands of Jews and allies into solidarity with the Palestinian freedom struggle and a vision of Judaism beyond Zionism. Olivia Kotby is an organizer with the BDS movement and is based in Portland, Oregon. She served as the North American coordinator for the Palestinian led BDS movement from 2019 to 2020, where she led and supported BDS campaigning across the US and Canada and Canada, excuse me. She's also organized with the Portland chapter of the Democratic Socialists of America, where she served as co-chair from 27, 2017 to 2021. So thanks to all of you for joining us. Um, I, Omar, I'd like to direct the first question to you. I think in a moment like now where people are really desperate for answers about what to do, it can be very isolating to be by yourself watching the news right now. Um, the BDS movement, as I said earlier, I think it's been the most successful challenge to Israeli apartheid in, in his entire existence. I'm hoping that you can give people a little context for how it emerged and, and exactly why it's been so successful. Uh, thanks a lot, Jason, uh, for this. 
Well, I think most people now are asking, how can we stop the genocide? That's the most urgent uh, item. So to the, to some, it might seem, why would we even discuss boycotts and divestment? And then how is that even remotely possible now? Shouldn't we just all be in the streets demonstrating and doing sit-ins and occupations as JVP has been leading and other groups across the world? Uh, absolutely. Now is the time to do everything possible to stop the genocide. And the U.S. is not a supporter of this genocide. Palestinian civil society views the U.S. as a full partner in genocide, funding, leading, uh, uh, arming, uh, uh, justifying, protecting, defending from accountability, global accountability at the United Nations. Just today, there was a vote at the UN on UNRWA, on the, on the UN Agency for Palestinian Refugees, and it was 164 supporting UNRWA against four, the US, Israel, and a, and a couple of other countries. So that shows how the US is getting more isolated worldwide. In this picture, BDS gives the tools to not just vent anger now, not just show, express, feelings and, and uh, slogans today, which is extremely important, but plant the seeds of change for tomorrow as well, for the day after, so to speak, when we all, all this collective movement, we build enough power to force a ceasefire, to force humanitarian into Gaza, lifting the siege, and we stop the genocide, the day after, we will exact accountability. It will come, as we've always done, when 75 years of Israel's regime of settler colonialism and apartheid, we've always said they have to pay a price in this. And the price we make them pay is through uh, cutting the links of complicity, state, corporate, institutional complicity. And that's where BDS comes in. So everyone who's demonstrating in the streets, do, participating in those wonderful, extremely inspiring sit-ins and occupations, especially the ones led by JVP, uh, then they come back and say, well, what am I doing longer term? Well, everyone is a member of some entity, some association, some union, some uh, organization, some community where they can have an influence. And the first question they need to ask is, are we doing harm? Because solidarity begins with ending complicity. Before we can do solidarity, we've got to make sure we're not doing harm. Well, US taxpayers are doing harm. Uh, by paying taxes to the state, to, to, to the to the country, to the government, but that's the, you can hardly do anything about that. You cannot stop paying taxes. Some people have, but the absolute majority won't. But you can offset the harm done with your tax money, your tax money that's going in arms and 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 and, and missiles that are killing our children in Gaza. Uh, uh, you can offset that harm by uh, ending the complicity within your community, your organization. That's why BTS, which was started in 2005, gave a real way for people to express solidarity in a very, very effective way to build people power. So in 2005, the absolute majority of Palestinian society came together, established the BDS movement, which is inspired by the South African anti-apartheid movement and the US civil rights movement, as well as many other struggles around the world. Obviously, it's a nonviolent uh, uh, movement that uh, abides by international law, universal principles of human rights. It calls for ending the occupation, ending the system of apartheid and the rights of refugees, the absolute majority of Palestinians. The absolute majority in Gaza today are refugees. So the right of return for refugees is the most important right that the BDS works on. That's why it has established a consensus among Palestinians, regardless of what their political views on the solution. One state, two states, democratic state, no matter what, we don't discuss solutions in the BDS movement. Whatever solution Palestinians opt for have to be built uh, uh, on ending occupation, ending apartheid, and the right of return. Uh, since its inception, BDS has uh, taken a very clear stance against all forms of racism. So it is in, in line with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, opposes all forms of racism and discrimination, including Islamophobia, anti-Black racism, anti-Semitism, uh, uh, sexism, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, this has formed a basis for BDS to grow universally, uh, um, working with trade unions, uh, social justice, racial justice, gender justice, uh, queer movements, climate justice movements across the world, building people power to challenge the powers that be and to end those relations of complicity with states, with corporations and institutions as the most effective way 
to, to end Israel's regime, to dismantle Israel's regime of settler colonialism and apartheid. It cannot continue oppressing us and killing us and, and committing genocide against us without those links of complicity. That's why it, it is just a, a, a no-brainer. That's what you've got to do. The first step of solidarity is end complicity. Do no harm. Uh, for St Stephanie or Olivia, I wonder, you know, you both do a, a bunch of BDS or a bunch of Palestine-related solidarity work in the United States. I wonder if uh, maybe, Stephanie, if you could talk about what BDS has looked like for the for JVP, what it looked like maybe before and, and what it's looked like since. Great. Yeah, and just build, uh, great question and building on what you were saying too, Omar, it just feels like this, there's a way in which the, this is a drop everything, do everything in our power to bring about a ceasefire at the first possible second and moment that it's possible. It's like, we're not advancing. Oh, it's, it's, it's every second we know that Palestinians are being murdered in Gaza. We, have, we, we just have to, um, to move with as much speed and clarity with that focus as possible. But I really agree with the notion that in some senses, our instincts, especially from here in the US, of what is necessary to do to end this genocide as it's happening before us, also is evidence and information for everybody to understand, like, there's a movement here to join that is in that same direction. There are, it's like, okay, we know what we need to do to end this particular horrifying genocidal war on Gaza, but actually we also know what's happening in the West Bank right now, where settlers armed to the teeth by, you know, funded by U.S. money, semi-automatic weapons handed to them by the Israeli soldiers who are by their sides, ethnically cleansing Palestinians in the West Bank at the greatest number that we've seen since 1948. Um, we see all of this happening throughout all of the land, and we understand that there's actually a movement and there's, there's clarity in what we're doing right now that can guide us into the action, as Omar said, for the day after, right? And so we're seeing that um, for us as a US-based organization, I think we we all, you know, BDS is a beautifully global movement and is growing by leaps and bounds all around the globe. We have like an acute understanding of what it means to do this work from the heart of US empire and understanding that, like, as Omar said, it's not just an enabling, it's a partnership. And really that the US-Israel alliance, um, you know, rooted in US imperialism and militarism and racism and colonialism here has always helped to drive the agenda and the profit logic of apartheid and the support that is just in droves from the US. And so we obviously right in this moment are like the US is who has the power to demand a ceasefire. We also understand that it's billions of dollars a year from the public sector, from our taxpayer dollars that are funding and fueling Israeli apartheid. And the BDS movement also gives us the tools not just to challenge that, but the billions of dollars that are also coming from the private sector, you know, and so we see that ability and we've had that ability then in the last 15 years to really say, um, okay, we understand that this can feel intractable, that the horrors of Israeli apartheid and decades of oppression and dispossession and discrimination can feel um, like, you know, structures of oppression are designed to make us feel like they're impenetrable. And un BDS gives us the tools and the actual ability to campaign in such a way that says, no, these are systems built by people, by governments, by money, we can take them apart in that same way. And so, um, you know, over the last 25 years, we've run and won campaigns from making retirement giant TIA, CREF, divest from com companies that were profiting off the Israeli occupation. Um, we've driven down birthright enrollment numbers. We've forced together in coalition through our deadly exchange campaign, the Anti-Defamation League, which is one of the fiercest, like most anti-Palestinian organizations in the world, really, to stop their once banner police exchange programs with Israel. Um, and all of all of these things have been done in, in coalition and in the ability to actually say, okay, here is something where we see the kind of nexus of oppression from the US to Israel being held up. Um, and what can we do from right here to actually end this specific part of what's holding up the infrastructure of Israeli apartheid? And so many of those, those pieces have fallen and now we need to be, as we're gathering in, in historic numbers, 
um, preparing for the ways in which we don't just achieve a ceasefire at the soonest possible minute, but that we continue to like really dismantle the systems that are upholding oppression in the first place from right here in the in the heart of U.S. empire. So we'll talk we'll talk more, but that's in brief <laughs> or or not so brief. Olivia, how, how have you seen it affect the work out in Portland or, or in DSA nationally? Yeah, I want to just talk about um, a couple different concrete examples of some successful um, BDS campaigns in the U.S. from the last several years. Um, like you mentioned, I, I started as a BDS activist in the Democratic Socialists of America in my chapter in Portland um, before I began working as the North America coordinator for the BDS movement. So I want to talk about a BDS campaign that we did in Portland that was really context specific to our area, but I hope can sort of be an example for a creative kind of BDS campaign that um, others can replicate within their context. So in 2018, um, the Great March of Return was happening, which was the, the massive nonviolent protests of Palestinians in Gaza um, along the, the militarized border fence, uh, where hundreds of Palestinians were killed by Israeli snipers um, along the fence, thousands more were injured. Um, we noticed in these photos of these, <clears throat> excuse me, the Israeli snipers, um, that the scopes they were using were Leupold and Stevens scopes. So Leupold and Stevens is a relatively small um, rifle and weapons company that's based just outside of Portland. Um, and we found out they had this contract with the IDF to provide scopes. We also knew that Leupold and Stevens sponsored a segment at Portland Trailblazers Games, which is our NBA team. Uh, the segment was called Hometown Hero, where they would honor a military veteran during the game. They got a loophole gift bag, the loophole logo, and the promo video was all over the arena. So it was great publicity for Leupold and Stevens. One important thing we know about BDS campaigns is that you want to pick targets and campaigns, number one, that are winnable, uh, and number two, that can attract, you know, community support and do like public education outside of just people who already know about Palestine, already support the issue. So we knew loophole probably wasn't going to be movable on supplying the scopes to the IDF. You know, they're a weapons manufacturer. That's what they do. So we started a campaign to pressure the Portland Trailblazers to end this partnership with Leupold and Stevens. Um, so we started like at the beginning of basketball season, we showed up actually at a few summer community events, just flyering and educating the community and Blazers fans about the partnership. Um, we went to media day where we built a relationship with some sports reporters who were interested and, in, you know, you don't see this stuff a lot around <laughs> NBA uh, spaces and, you know, they were able to ask the Blazers about this partnership um, during their press conferences. Um, we showed up at games to pass out flyers, did a projection on the outside of the arena. Um, but our big action was when we got a veteran um, actually nominated for Hometown Hero, uh, who then was recognized at the game and protested the partnership, unzipped his shirt to reveal or unzipped his sweatshirt to reveal a shirt that said, and this sponsorship, hashtag no loophole, um, took a knee. And, you know, that was covered in, you know, international media and there was a lot of press for it. And he gave a lot of good interviews about um, why he as a military veteran was protesting uh, the partnership and what was happening in Palestine. So after all that, the following season, um, the Blazers and Leupold jointly announced they would no longer be partnering. Um, so that's an example of like a local campaign we did where, you know, Leupold isn't necessarily like a household name, a national target, but it made sense for our local context. Um, there are a couple other campaigns I want to briefly mention. The first is G4S, which was a huge campaign, uh, a global campaign against this global security company, G4S, um, which was launched many years ago. Um, at the time, G4S was providing uh, equipment and services to Israeli prisons, um, as well as providing equipment for checkpoints and Israeli police. Um, so after years of global campaigning, which included um, campaigns to end government contracts with G4S, um, huge divestment from G4S by the Gates Foundation. Uh, in December 2016, G4S sold off its subsidiary. Um, it still maintained a stake in the Israeli Police Training Academy. Um, so after Allied Universal, which is another big global security company, acquired G4S in 2021, um, BDS groups in North America started pressuring Allied Universal um, with a lot of leadership actually from BDS Quebec uh, because the Quebec Pension Fund was a majority shareholder in Allied Universal. 
So after a lot of pressure in Quebec, um, Allied finally announced uh, in 2022 that it had sold the stake in Policity. So G4S campaign has officially been won, and that is huge. Um, we also recently, last year, won a campaign against General Mills because Pillsbury products um, were being manufactured in a factory in an illegal Israeli settlement. Um, and that was sort of a, a more fun, if you can call it fun, a creative consumer boycott campaign, um, you know, where we just got to get creative with the the Doughboy imagery and Pillsbury products. Um, and it was really like a consumer boycott campaign, but also um, activists in Minnesota where General Mills is headquartered um, really helped in that campaign, tried to reach out to General Mills workers. Um, and General Mills announced last year that it would no longer be manufacturing Pillsbury products in the factory. Um, the other campaign I want to mention is Ben and Jerry's. Um, this campaign started years ago with activists in Vermont um, who were pressuring Ben and Jerry's to stop selling their ice cream in Israel and the illegal Israeli settlements. Um, and, you know, that was a conversation that was going on for years. Um, but the campaign was really carried to victory by activists with the Movement for Black Lives um, who had built this relationship uh, in 2020 with Ben and Jerry's. Um, because Ben and Jerry's is like a progressive company uh, relatively and taking positions in favor of the, the movement against um, police brutality. And, you know, it only made sense for them while they were taking these progressive positions to also take this position to stop doing business in an apartheid state. Um, and, you know, of course, with that campaign, there was controversy with their parent company. With all of these campaigns, there's going to be backlash. There's going to be backtracking and, you know, statements about business decisions being unrelated to Israel's policies or, you know, it's not related to the activist pressure. That's what they have to say to cover their bases. I think it's it's undeniable that, you know, when we pick a campaign that is strategic and work towards winning it, we do make an impact and it's not sustainable to do business with an apartheid state. And so I'm really encouraged that there's a lot of interest in BDS right now. And, you know, there's so many people who are learning about BDS for the first time. And yeah, I hope that we can be helpful to them. Thanks. I, I mean, it's, it's, it's endlessly exciting to see what kind of victories we can pull off in different parts of the country. Um, I just, I want to back up for a second because I think that for people who are like, who have politicized around this issue in the last five or 10 years, it's sort of unimaginable what, like how, what a difference BDS has been in the world of Palestine solidarity in the United States. Like Steph, JVP has been around since the early, the early nineties, right? Can you just talk a little bit about what life was like before BDS and what BDS did to our ability to, to organize? Yeah, I mean, I think that like there was a lot, a lot of, you know, the we all for those of us have been uh, in solidarity with Palestinians for years and decades. Um, you know what we see the atrocity, the sort of historic uh, atrocities we see unfolding in Gaza right now is also like incredibly familiar. You know, um, it it happens so frequently um, that. Israel bombards Gaza in this manner that the Israeli government calls it mowing the grass. You know, it's just like one form of the expression of the settler colonial domination that Israel's been um, been doing from its inception. And I think that for us as a, you know, for we with legacy going back since before the Palestinian call for boycott, divestment and sanctions, I can think about like the early years and w when it was just a Bay Area chapter of Jewish Voice for Beasts, where it was like, you know, going to the Israeli embassy to try to protest and say, not in our names, not in our names. The exact same thing we're saying now where we see Jewish, you know, Jewish names used, the Jewish identity used, Jewish pain, grief or trauma used to justify um, the Israeli government's actions, we've had that same core motivation, but, you know, yelling at the Israeli embassy does very little when we're actually in the belly of the beast in which billions of dollars go every year to unconditional constant support and propping up and enabling of Israeli apartheid. And so the call from Palestinian civil society in 2005 was transformative, I think, for activists around the world and certainly for us as an organization of Jews to say, Oh my God, what a beautiful articulation of shared values, as Omar was pointing out, and of the path forward, right? Of like, what are the principles and of international law that allow us to be very clear-eyed about what is being uh, 
what we're what we're aiming for and the values of how we come together as a movement um, and also an invitation to practical tactical um, ways wherein for every freedom struggle turning grassroots power into nonviolent economic leverage that ends injustice we've seen it from you know we we know it worked in south africa and the black freedom struggle here and farm worker organizing and organizing the, for indian independence against british colonization and so i think to have access to the legacy of those tools and tactics and how to campaign strategically as olivia is pointing out has given us just like unlocked our ability to not only bring people in in our rage and our grief and our all our set of feelings as omar was talking about but to actually be really clear eyed that there is we can take action, we can take strategic action and there's actually a deep theory of change about how we can seek and accomplish freedom, justice and equality, which is what we all I know feel emotionally, but it's a it's a road and a path. And so for us, it's been, you know, fundamental and essential for guiding our actions and allowing us to um, also understand our core mandate as a Jewish organization, which for us, there are many, many um, individuals, organizations, entities that uphold the U.S.-Israel alliance for Israeli apartheid. We take responsibility for the Jewish Zionist organizations that provide that massive amount of enabling support within that set of, uh, of actors um, to ensure that we hold the, them accountable and, and take on those targets as well to, to, to take away that support for the alliance. And so it's provided a pathway and a clarity for us to, to take meaningful action. Thanks. Um, so Omar, uh, you know, at the beginning I said that I think BDS has been the most effective tool and which, you know, I, I don't need to litigate whether it's been the most effective tool, but it's undeniably been an incredibly effective tool. Um, I, I wanted to move into a little bit about, to talk about the backlash from Israel and from Zionist organizations against BDS. But before we do that, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about like to just concretize a little bit about why that's been so terrifying for, for Israel. Can you just talk about some of the, the accomplishments uh, of the BDS movement over the last 10 years? And then maybe if you could speak a little bit to like what we've seen, uh, what the what the contours of the of Israel's attempt to crush BDS has looked like. Uh, sure. Since BDS was established in 2005, Israel immediately noticed that this movement has potential because it was based on international law, human rights, it sounds very nice and liberal, yet it was very radical in calling for actually dismantling the system of settler colonial apartheid that existed. And it united Palestinians, which was the real danger for Israel. Those Palestinians disagree on everything. How could they unite on this one piece of paper issued in 2005 that has a, a number of principles and, and, and uh, a common ground that everyone, almost everyone agrees with. So Palestinian unity on BDS was considered one of the major problems for Israel. Uh, uh, the movement being nonviolent and anti-racist was another real problem for Israel because in the BDS call, and I always say that people may forget that, it's one page, I really recommend that people read it. In that one page, there's a call on conscientious Israelis to join us in this movement for freedom, justice, and equality to dismantle this system of injustice. And the BDS call is not like some ivory tower call signed by, you know, three nice academics in, in some university, with all due respect to academics. It was signed by who's who in Palestinian society in uh, historic Palestine, as well as in exile. Uh, um, and it, everyone agreed that we do not view Israelis as individuals as the enemy. The enemy is the system of settler colonialism and apartheid. Uh, 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 we see dismantling this system as opening up space for joint resistance, joint co uh, coexistence based on justice, on equal rights, on uh, applying international law. So that was the main threat, if you will. In, from 2014, though, that Israel's dealing with BDS has taken a shift to a much, much more serious uh, um, damage control. By 2014, they realized, 2013 specifically, they realized that BDS was not just a nice campus movement, a few radical students. They started seeing, as Olivia mentioned, big pension funds divest from Israeli banks and companies involved in Israeli oppression of Palestinians. 
the Norwegian pension fund, the absolute largest sovereign fund in the world, divesting from companies involved in, in, in apart and so on and so forth. So they started and churches in the United States, Presbyterians were the first in 2014 to divest from several American companies that are enabling Israeli occupation. So they start seeing, oh, oh, this is having a real economic impact, not just symbolic, not just a few artists announcing, although that's extremely important, that they will not play Tel Aviv, it's the new Sun City, it's the new apartheid, we will not play Tel Aviv. And academics and academic associations, they started seeing that it's growing. So since end of 2013, beginning 2014, it was the Netanyahu government then, by the way, it said openly that BDS is a strategic threat. They use that language strategic threat. A couple of years later, they said it's an existential threat, uh, uh, which was strange, but we took it as a badge of honor, basically, a nonviolent, uh, almost 99.9% .9 volunteer based movement is taken to present such a threat to a nuclear power like Israel, that is funded and enabled by the United States by empire, the only empire. Uh, how could they feel so threatened by such a nonviolent movement? because we, they know we have the right formula, so to speak. We have the right strategy, so to speak, that to build this people power that Stephanie was describing across the world. So while we're focused today on, on the United States, in my daily work, I, I'm a volunteer with the movement, I don't work in the movement. In my daily work, especially now in, in, in trying to stop this genocide, on an average day, I, need, I deal with movements in Indonesia, in India, in South Africa, in Chile, in Brazil, in, in Europe, in the Arab world, North America. That's my daily work. My colleagues and I, that's every day. We deal with movements across the world. A trade union here just today, uh, Barcelona port uh, uh, workers announced that they, are jo they have joined the dock workers responsible for handling uh, in refusing to handle any ships carrying military weapons to Israel, just today. And just yesterday, Turkish, uh, Italian, and Greek trade unions, port unions, announced they will not handle any weapons going to Israel transiting through their ports and airports. Uh, so that's just one example of what we need. So Israel is, is noticing that this is not like the New York Times likes to say, uh, this movement that has some traction on campuses, seriously, some traction on campuses, when we're affecting banks and major corporations, we're bringing them to their knees, forcing them, after losing billions and billions of dollars, to quit Israeli market, to quit their system of oppression. Uh, um, so that's why I think they, they're seeing it as, as so uh, substantial. Going back to the second part of your question, the, the modes of repression. Since 2014, when they decided it's a strategic threat, uh, it was leaked from an Israeli cabinet meeting to discuss BDS that they adopted basically three strategies on fighting BDS. More propaganda, and Israel is, you know, first class propaganda producer in the world, uh, almost unmatched. Second, using their intelligence services, military intelligence, Mossad, Shabak, all their intelligence services to spy on and try to sabotage the movement, as they said, from within and without. And third, lawfare, legal warfare to try to bug us down, to pull us down with lawsuit after frivolous lawsuit, smearing us with all sorts of, of fabrications and so on, to just make it so difficult for anyone to do any work. The chilling effect is, is very, very serious. But as we've always said, the chilling, effects, uh, the chilling effect takes two, the chiller and the chilled. If you, if you refuse to be chilled by it, you continue working, uh, they, there's nothing they can do to stop you. And we are a good example. I mean, we're Palestinian, uh, brown people, it's not exactly privileged. They've tried everything against us, every form of repression you can imagine, from in, trying to infiltrate uh, BDS groups, trying to even, on October 10th, uh, one, October 9th, one of our statements, this is completely new hacking, they entered into our website, changed certain sentences in our statement to make us look as if we're supporting this or that. It's just by accident that we, no that we noticed. I mean, our media officer was saying, who wrote this? We, we, we did not post this. What happened to our statement? So we said, oh my God, this is a new insidious type of hacking that we've never seen before. I mean, we've, we're used to the regular hacking, taking down our website, putting you know Israeli flag on the BDS movement website, but not this 
taking out certain lines and changing, but that's what they're doing. So they're taking it very, very seriously. They're trying to suppress us with all sorts of things, including some of our activists getting arrested, uh, including travel bans, including uh, uh, smearing us and trying to demonize us, and including dozens of U.S. legislatures passing anti-BDS legislation. And I'll end with this, which we've warned since 2015, 2016. Anyone in the U.S., any liberal, decent person who thinks this will stop at Palestinians? Think again. If anyone knew anything about U.S. history and McCarthyism, it never stops at the declared target. You know, they go after the communists or the Jews or whatever, and they don't stop there. They go after every dissenter, everyone that's seen as presenting a risk to the government. And indeed, anti-BDS legislation, which was passed in all these dozens of legislatures across the U.S., are have begun a couple of years ago to be used against the black justice movement, the climate justice movement, the women reproductive rights movement, and so on and so forth. The election uh, uh, movement, election, electoral rights and, and, and enfranchisement uh, of uh, black voters. They started to use it to suppress all that. And, and that's what we've been saying, that intersectionality is not just the oppressors being very intersectional. We defending our rights, our justice movements, we have to be intersectional as well. Thanks. Um, I mean, one of the, you know, I, I don't know, do you guys remember when Israel used to be call itself the only democracy in the Middle East, which that was like the main line. We are in a sea of hostile anti-democratic regimes and we're the only democracy in the Middle East. I haven't heard that lately. Maybe they're saying it somewhere else. I haven't heard it lately because it's very hard to argue that you're the only democracy in the Middle East when you spend millions of dollars shutting down free speech on campuses, you know, in like, like actually in state houses, through courthouses, et cetera. It's just become something that they can't claim anymore. So they've had to move, you know, progressively to the right. Um, Olivia, I wonder what that's looked like. You know, can you just draw that out a little bit more, what that's looked like in North America? What are some of the ways that you're seeing are, that our movement's been attacked, uh, you know, for, for doing BDS? Yeah, I mean, Omar mentioned, I believe the number is now 38 states have some form of anti-BDS law on the books. Um, lots of campuses, institutions uh, across the country, even the White House, um, have had pushes to adopt the IHRA definition of anti-Semitism, which um, classifies criticism of Israel as anti-Semitism. And maybe Stephanie can talk a little bit more about that, because I know that Jewish Voice for Peace has done some work on that. Um, I think we're seeing campus repression right now, like at an all time high. It's it's for sure been the case for a number of years. You know, Canary Mission, which is the database of uh, campus activists who have spoken up for Palestine. And, you know, it, it's a smear. It's a racist smear campaign against um, campus activists for Palestine um, that still exists. Um, we're seeing, you know, universities now are like dechartering um, students for justice in Palestine chapters and not even letting them have rallies. Um, there's this new push we're seeing to try to frame uh, from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free as anti-Semitic, you know, and that is why um, Rashida Tlaib, as you mentioned, got censured. Um, and, you know, she should be proud <laughs> to be censured by a Congress that overwhelmingly supports genocide. Like that is a badge of honor. Why would you want their approval? Um, I, it's my understanding. I didn't know. I was like, what is censure? What does that mean? It ultimately has no consequences. It's just a statement of we're officially mad at you. And I think it's a good thing to be disliked by people who support genocide. And they've been attacking Rashida since day one. So it's not really a surprise. It's just, it's really just like a mask off moment for these people who are trying to create a distraction because that is what we have to remember, um, that there is so much repression of the movement for justice in Palestine because Israel and its supporters are absolutely terrified of how much popular organic grassroots support there is for Palestine. This is not an astroturfed movement like, like these pro-Israel protests are. You know, Remember that these attacks are coming because Israel's reputation is no longer, I don't think, the only democracy in the Middle East. You know, it's really in the international community, their reputation is slipping and it's no longer able to win, you know, the court of public opinion. There's no way for them to defend their actions. There's no way to defend a genocide. We have eyes. We're not stupid. So because they can't defend their actions, they can't explain away apartheid, they rely on this repression instead. And, you know, I've been targeted in the past. Um, People have lost their jobs and yeah, it sucks. 
for individuals who are being targeted, but we have to zoom out and look at the big picture and realize, like Omar said, you know, the overall strategy of repression and blacklisting and smearing is not working. Um, I think we're seeing now the movement for Palestine is bigger than ever, despite these attacks, and it's not having um, the chilling effect that Israel was hoping it would have. It's not deterring people from speaking out. And I think it's even encouraging more people to get involved because it's maddening <laughs> to watch some of this backlash happen in real time. And I think the best thing we can do um, in the face of these racist smear campaigns uh, against advocates for Palestine is really, yeah, just continue to be courageous and continue to lead with our values um, and not get bogged down by what really is a distraction. I think it'll only serve to legitimize and to strengthen um, our detractors. So I think we have to, you know, forge on in this fight and draw these connections between our movements. Like Omar said, it's not just supporters of Palestine. These sorts of repression tactics will be used against all these other movements for justice. And um, we can't get free without each other, you know, but I think united, we can't be defeated. And that's what they're scared of. And time to prove them right. Yes, yes. I mean, that actually, that's a perfect segue. I, I, I absolutely. Uh, Steph, I want to ask you, like, so the 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 line of attack on BDS is that BDS, you know, you know, criticism of Israel is anti-Semitic, BDS is anti-Semitic, just JPs are anti-Semitic, etc. So in comes JVP, which will, with a real lane to be like, hey, guess what? There's lots and lots, there's tens of thousands of Jews who also don't support what Israel's doing, right? But then, you know, then JVP winds up incurring all the whole different kind of attack. I, you know, I, I wonder if you can talk about, about that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's just wild even just like hearing us describe the way the attacks uh, take place. Like for folks who are new, I, I you sh if you feel a little shocked, you should be shocked. It's like here you have like truly a call at the mo it's so simple that institutions and governments should not be profiting off and directly complicit in Israeli apartheid and colonialism and a nonviolent movement making way for a future as you said Omar of coexistence rooted in actual justice freedom and equality like it's so simple and so because of that the massive hundreds of millions of dollars and government infrastructure to try to crush this movement um you know, I can't tell you the number of people who've, you know, I've I've worked with who've come from other movements for justice and started to take action around, you know, boycott, divestment and sanctions and been like, oh, my God, the level of repression here is unbelievable. You know, it's like really intense. And at the same time, we're so strong together, as you were saying, Olivia. And for us as a as a Jewish org, I just wanted to, you know, it's like talk a little bit of maybe about our deadly exchange campaign as one example of both how we were um, taking on directly these like completely um, like dangerous, frankly, misstating of what anti-Semitism is in order to try to shut down the movement um, and, and what that has allowed us to be able to do. So um, just to say, as you're saying, Jason, that like, you know, the Israeli government as part of the attack on BDS has also run a very concerted campaign to actually redefine legally the very definition of anti-Semitism in order to equate it and conflate it with these efforts to hold the Israeli government accountable for its massive violations of human rights and international law. And to try to do that in a moment when the right wing around the world is ascendant with in in a rate is that is racist and anti-Semitic and Islamophobic and all the things we know is incredibly dangerous for the fight against real anti-Semitism, not to mention a very, very intense bludgeon against Palestinian uh, free speech and this movement, this clear values based movement for justice that we're all part of. And so, um, you know, we have no problem resisting that. It's such an obvious um, ploy to shut down the movement. And at the same time, of course, we're then called self-hating Jews, etc. cetera. Um, and we understand that some of the major institutions that push that conflation are, are organizations like the Anti-Defamation League, which um, also, you know, is, is basically parades as a civil rights organization while advancing these incredibly damaging and dangerous misdefinitions of anti-Semitism in order to advance its very, very blatantly anti-Palestinian agenda of continuing Israeli apartheid at all costs. Um, and so, 
in um, in 2017 or 18, we launched um, in coalition with a broad range of partners, um, uh, folks like the Red Nation, Movement for Black Lives, um, uh, here in the U.S., a campaign to end the U.S.-Israel police exchange programs that were a central, central program of the Anti-Defamation League. Um, and if you think about that for just a moment, the ADL has been the largest non-governmental trainer of the police in the U.S. Um, for years. And just the notion of that should should sort of shake everybody for a minute, right? Like, why is this organization that says it's a civil rights organization that says it fights for racial justice doing this? Um, we all know that, as Omar was saying, the systems of you, the the systems of white supremacy and racism and um, police uh, policing and pr imprisonment in the U.S. Um, has its legacy in colonialism and slavery here in the U.S. and needs no notes on how to be racist. And at the same time, the Israeli apartheid system um, functions in order to also, in addition to the direct oppression and um, horrifying years of, of um, oppression of Palestinians, occupation of Palestinians, also as a testing ground for weaponry, for tactics, for technologies that are then distributed back around the world, back into the US um, in order to strengthen the tactics, technologies, arms, et cetera, et cetera of these interconnected systems of oppression. And so for us, looking at this way that US-Israel police exchange programs worked, we call it a worst practices exchange, you know? Um, and so this campaign grew and um, took root in communities across the country. The Durham, the Durham um, uh, community gathered around a demilitarized from Durham to Palestine, a coalition that managed to get the city council to um, ban such exchange programs for their police forces. We saw um, multiple places like Northampton, um, and the, the um, state of Vermont get their own uh, uh, state or city forces to cancel and skip these trips when scheduled. And ultimately, um, last in a couple of years ago, we saw released, um, um, leaked out a memo from inside the Anti-Defamation League in 2020, showing that they, actually the organization had recommended to end these exchange programs because they admitted directly that they did in fact see how they could be contributing to the rise of police brutality and the increase of police brutality in the already incredibly brutal and racist police force here in the US. And that also the pressure they felt from the unified front of the combination of the powerful movement for black lives rising in the street to demand an end to um, you know, historic injustice here was and it being in deep alignment with Palestinians calling for freedom and those of us joining in the global struggles and how they're all interconnected. But the force of that was having their donors drop, their public reputation was being um, um, harmed. And we saw the power of when we come together in the face of these enormous technologies and infrastructures of repression, actually our people's movements are so much stronger than all of the millions of dollars used to try to repress them. And so we know that it works. We know that it works in the force of, you know, the ADL is a hundred million dollar organization putting all of its energy into fighting this movement. And still we can force them to stop one of their banner programs that is part of how they are trying to advance Israeli apartheid. And so just a reminder that like, you know, the next month, Jonathan Greenblatt, their CEO got on, um, on TV and said, our number one goal is to stop um, the movement. And they, they named JVP and Students for Justice in Palestine and CARE. And they said it's their number one priority to attack these organizations and to bring every tool, as Omar said, of lawfare, of public media, of spurious attacks, to do everything they could within their power, legislatively, they said, in order to stop these organizations. And in that speech, and this is important, he also said that he sees our organizations and our movement as the photo inverse of the Proud Boys. And I just want to pause there to be like, the willingness they have to completely distort the meaning and the, the the intense and material need to stop right-wing anti-Semitism that is violently, you know, like advancing in the streets against Jews, against Muslims, against black people in this country, that they were willing to try to confuse even 
white supremacists marching in the streets with our, our movement for justice and equality and dignity for all people means that they have no interest in dismantling real anti-Semitism and only interest in confusing and conflating and making a very dangerous environment for all of us. Um, and they went to that extent because of the power of the movement. So the stronger those attacks, the more we have to understand that's a sign of our the way that we're banding together, the way that we're joined in our values against all forms of oppression and toward collective liberation, and really the way that centering Palestinian rights and freedom frees us all because it allows us to cut the bullshit, frankly, and be really clear on our principles and what we're striving for and how to take down these intersectional systems of oppression that are harming all of our communities. Thanks, Steph. That actually leads, uh, you know, I, I, I want to end the event in a little bit about questions about where do we go from here, but we've gotten a number of questions from people watching that I think actually come, come that makes sense to, to address right now. It seems like people are really uh, sort of grappling with how do we plug in? What do we do? So I'm going to ask a couple of questions together and see if you all have responses to any of the pieces. Um, you know, there's how do I start a BDS campaign? There's um, what about uh, what about organizations that may be complicit but are not explicitly targeted by the BDS movement? Um, there's another about the role of academic boycott and how to replicate it at, at your own university. So it seems like people are really trying to think about how do I bring BDS to my to my town or my city. Um, I'm wondering if if anybody has a specific response to like, how do I start a BDS chapter? What do we do about targets that aren't explicitly named by the BDS movement? And uh, and what you know, what's the role of academic boycott and how do we bring it to our university? If I can just jump in, um, I would love for Omar to talk in depth about academic boycott, um, but I just wanna kind of zoom out and give like an overview of the different kinds of BDS campaigns to choose from. Um, and I would say choose the one that is like most strategic and um, achievable in your own local context. I also want to say, you know, that many people are, you know, personally boycotting brands that have stated support for Israel, um, and that's great. Um, the BDS movement put out a statement sort of clarifying what our targets are right now um, and why we're targeting specific companies in specific ways. And I think the organizers of this event will post that link in the chat. Um, but I just want to stress that. BDS isn't just about consumer boycotts and it's most effective when it's taken as a collective action. So more important than you know your own purchases is working within an organization, a union or a coalition um, to organize effective campaigns and to, to build power globally. Um, so when you see these massive lists of dozens and dozens of companies to boycott that are going around on social media, please keep in mind the goal isn't to boycott as many companies as possible. The goal is to pick a few targets and exert enough collective pressure to actually win a campaign, meaning a specific company stops doing business with Israel or a specific institu institution um, divests its investments uh, from Israeli companies or a specific city ends its relationship with the Israeli government in some way. So a campaign can include a municipal boycott. So for example, um, your city ends their contract that they had with HP to purchase HP computers. Um, academic boycott, um, which I would love for Omar to talk more about academic and cultural boycotts. Um, cultural boycotts, meaning, you know, like a celebrity cancels that performance in Israel. Um, sports boycotts. So, you know, U.S. teams could refuse to play against Israeli teams or Israel could get suspended from FIFA. Um, consumer boycott. So like, a co-op grocery store will stop selling Sabra hummus. Um, and then there's divestment, which is huge. Um, that can include getting your city, your university, um, your church. As Omar mentioned, there have been huge victories in the in the church uh, movement in the United States, actually, for divestment. Um, your trade union. Trade unions actually have a lot of investments um, in, in Israel, in companies, and as well as Israel bonds. Um, you know, and pension funds as well have a lot of investments in Israel bonds. Um, so getting those institutions to withdraw investments um, in in corporations complicit in Israeli apartheid or, you know, divesting from Israel itself. Um, and I think a couple considerations as you sort of research and pick a campaign and target. Um, number one, what is the potential for success? Like, is there a realistic chance of success beyond just raising awareness? You know, does your target Maybe they have a social, social, um, socially responsible investment policy or like a code of ethics, um, and you know, is is it accessible? And do you have like relationships that you can leverage? Can you map out 
um, you know, your target and, and the points of power and the decision makers. Um, number two is, will it help build coalitions with other social justice struggles? Um, like we mentioned, there have been a lot of intersectional campaigns. Um, G4S was a big one because, you know, not only was it oppressing Palestinians, um, it was running youth detention center centers and uh, transporting immigrants uh, for ICE in the U.S. and, you know, had prison contracts all over the world. So that was a big intersectional campaign. Um, and really these cross struggle campaigns help us grow power across our movements, um, not only for Palestine. And number three is, will your campaign like engage that broad support and build awareness and, you know, be able to get in the media and do this public education piece because so many people either don't know anything about Palestine um, or, you know, they're hearing one narrative um, that is not true. So will this campaign, you know, will this resonate with people, everyday people um, who maybe don't know anything about Palestine and will it bring more people in? Um, so that's just sort of a general overview about BDS campaigns. Uh, I don't know, if, Stephanie, if you want to talk about some of the campaigns JVP has led, or shall I talk about academic first? Um, I might just add to what Olivia said that, you know, one of the things to think about is also, like, for those who are just joining the movement, is, like, join an organization. I want to encourage you. Like, organization matters. Like, the difference between like outrage and action is organizing. You know, we we like we are a, a disciplined and strategic and values based movement that really knows how to like do exactly what Olivia just laid out is like think hard about where are their points to actually make a move here and let's move together and have the power of our collective mean something. And especially when we are outnumbered um, in terms of political and financial power as a movement that people power and leveraging it as biggest as we can matters the most. So I would say like, if you're Jewish, join JVP, like um, we're, we've got campaigns now and always coming, right? But also um, AFSC, American Friends for Service Committee has campaigns running, Student for Justice in Palestine or JVP chapters on campuses, PYM, Palestinian Youth Movement, Adola Justice Project, US Campaign for Palestinian Rights, all these organizations are places to build collective power and to actually have campaigns that have focus and <clears throat> energy. So just to say, um, you don't have to go at it alone. You know what I mean? You don't have to make it from, from scratch. We're like, we've been doing this and we know how to do this and we actually um, w need you with us. So just to throw that in the mix before we talk. And then there's academic um, organizations to join as well, Omar. Maybe you could also mention when you talk about those, the way it works. Yes, thanks, Stephanie. Just to add exactly what Stephanie said, that there's a difference between showing power and building power. So we might show power by demonstrating on the streets, so show politicians that, you know, we matter, we have the numbers, but then building power, leveraging this, you absolutely have to organize. If you're not part of a group, join a group. If there's no one around you, you know, remotely join a group or build a group. But organizing is, is what matters. Individuals cannot be that effective in, in doing BDS because we cannot affect powers, the powers that be, basically. So when we talk about the academic boycott, before talking about how, or, or let's talk about why, because it's the most difficult part of BDS is the academic boycott, I think. Many academics tend to think that Israeli academic institutions, aren't they, uh, you know, basis for enrichment and uh, freedom and uh, no, there are pillars of settler colonialism and apartheid. They've always been, they've been created as a tool of settler colonialism before they became uh, centers of education. In fact, uh, the Hebrew University was established mainly as a colony to colonize Jerusalem before it became an important academic institution. So, it's, so academic institutions were really always a pillar of settler colonialism. And there's a book coming out uh, uh, soon from Verso by an, a brilliant uh, uh, young Israeli anthropologist who has been uh, researching with many, many, many uh, support, uh, with a lot of support from Palestinian researchers and, and academics and so on. She's putting together a book on the complicity of academic institutions. And it's horrendous. Even, even when I read some of that text and I'm really following the subject, I was shocked because some of it is in only in Hebrew. We've never seen it in, in English. When it's translated, you're just shocked at what they do in archaeology, in philosophy, in ethics, 
which is a field I'm studying, it's just unbelievable what they do. For example, the Dahiya doctrine, the doctrine being used now in Gaza, it basically was developed between the army, the military industries, and Tel Aviv University. Tel Aviv was the real hub where this came together. The, the Dahiya doctrine basically says, in order for Israel to defeat those irregular uh, 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 paramilitary groups, Palestinian armed groups, that they, it's not a regular army, the most effective way, Israel says, is to hit civilians and civilian infrastructure to make them uh, uh, suffer so much that they would act to stop any resistance to occupation, basically. And they've tried that in Lebanon, and they've been trying it in Gaza and across the West Bank. So uh, attacking civilians is not accidentally, this disproportionate force is a doctrine developed at Tel Aviv University. That's just one example. And of course, the weaponry and all the racist doctrines and the ethical guidelines for the military, that it's okay to kill 50 people if you want to target one person it's it's perfectly fine, legitimate, ethically to target. Imagine those doctrines are developed by philosophy departments in Israeli universities, not to mention all the other departments. So it's there's a there are tons of reasons why you should boycott Israeli universities. They are a pillar in the system of oppression, in designing it, implementing it, justifying it, and whitewashing it in every step of the way. They are involved in the crimes, including the current genocide in Gaza. Uh, so how do you plan an academic boycott campaign? One key operational principle in BDS is context sensitivity, basically, which means that there is no one size fits all. How we build an academic boycott campaign in, in the University of Cape Town in South Africa differs a lot from the UCLA, for example extremely different circumstances, uh, different alliances, different messaging, uh, but the goal is the same, cutting links of complicity between your institution, your academics, and Israeli academic institutions. It's important to say, al along with context sensitivity, sustainability and gradualness are the other two operational principles in BDS, which means don't just start a campaign because you feel it's right morally, that's not enough. To reach success, as Olivia mentioned, you've got to make it sustainable and gradual. Don't jump from A to Z because it will collapse. You've got to go one step at a time, build power, build alliances, make sure they're sustainable, then move to the next step. Sometimes it's boring, yes, but as Palestinians are experts in planting olive trees, it's boring, it's, it takes forever, it takes a lot of patience. You plant a seed and, and, and care for it and nourish it and, 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 and you get all kinds of terrible weather or the army bulldozing your tree or whatever, but you keep trying and keep trying until you harvest your olives. It takes enormous patience. And so with BDS campaigns, some of them take a lot of patience of building uh, power. Uh, uh, so with academic boycott campaigns, it's much easier than student activism because academics tend to be much more uh, stable, uh, much more protected, uh, not totally, but protected much more than students. Uh, we're seeing the repression from Florida to across the US now, the Brandeis and so on, repressing students for justice in Palestine, horrible repression. Academics are much more protected, especially tenured academics. So it's a safer space for them to organize. R research and students are always some very good researchers, even better than academics in these things, discover what projects are involved at your university that, uh, that with complicit Israeli universities and target the worst of those projects. So don't go after the lighter projects, you know, uh, psychology of, I don't know, relate, gender related psychological, pro okay, it's, it's bad, but let's focus on military, security, you know, the worst type of complicity, because as Olivia said, one of the criteria for BDS is how complicit is the project. The more complicit it is, the easier it is to explain to many, many academics. So you have the American Anthropological Association, the most recent one to adopt BDS, but before that, the Middle East studies, uh, American studies, uh, gender studies, women's studies, Asian American studies, uh, indigenous studies, so many associations uh, in the United States have adopted BDS. Join one of them if you're in, in that field. If not on your campus, can you start an Academics for Palestine, Academics for a Just Peace, whatever you want to call it, and start researching the worst projects and w campaign with students, with the community, churches, uh, progressive synagogues, whatever community you have, trade unions, extremely important in, in these alliances, target that one project and keep at it until you win. Because when you win, then you teach everyone else a lesson, the next win becomes much easier. 
Thank you. Uh, hopefully that was useful to the people at home. Uh, the, the, so the, the question I want to close with is sort of a big one. Um, you know, a, a few months, a few weeks ago, even a, a few months ago, BDS, you know, had like, the, the, you know, was, there was an idea that we want to slowly progress. We want to like rack up big wins. We want to keep embarrassing Israel. We want to keep building strategic victories. And now, you know, as we talked about at the beginning, we're seeing, you know, the most horrific uh, genocide. You know, I think this might be the most egregious thing Israel has done. We can certainly debate that, but um, it's unfolding. And I think people feel a sense of urgency that is well warranted because we want to do, like Steph said, we want to do anything we can to stop it right now. But I guess I want to return to the question of BDS, not as a sort of a historical treatment about it, what it has it done in the past, but like, what do we do now? What is, you know, what has changed because of what's happening? What is staying the same? Um, Olivia, I'm wondering if you if you can start off with that question. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a little bit of a misconception. Yeah, historically, yes, BDS has been really long term campaigning, and you know, this stuff has taken years. Um, but it doesn't necessarily have to. Uh, I think look how fast uh, institutions were condemning Russia and sanctioning Russia, uh, like overnight like that and there's no reason why this can't happen quickly um i think what i'm really hoping to focus on um i, I shared i hope that the event organizers shared the link to um, what some of the current targets are for bds movement um that action can be taken right now uh, but what i'm hoping to focus on right now is campaigning within labor unions um, and at the city level, city council, you know, we've seen a, a big wave of labor unions in the U.S. Um, signing on to statements to support a ceasefire, which is great. Um, a few city councils have passed resolutions to support a ceasefire or just issuing solidarity with Palestine, which which is huge in the U.S. You know, it's really breaking this barrier where city councilors love to say they can't comment on international issues uh, or it's not in their purview, except for Ukraine. Uh, it's simply not true. Uh, you know, we know that these unions and that these cities have investments with companies that are complicit in Israel's genocidal apartheid regime. Uh, you know, we know that cities often have large procurement contracts with some of these companies. Um, so I would love to see unions and cities who have passed resolutions in support of a ceasefire um, really try to take that next step and take on a bigger commitment of divesting from companies that might be profiting from Israeli violence. And there's no reason that that has to take a long time. Um, you know, for, here in Oregon, our state pension fund uh, made a snap decision to say, we're going to look into all our Russian investments, you know, but then we ask them to divest from NSO. Uh, which is an Israeli spyware company, uh, which has been used to facilitate human rights abuses worldwide, uh, is now currently being used by the Israeli military to help targeted killings in Gaza. Um, we had the the Oregon Education Association, the Oregon AFL-CIO, AFL um, they both passed resolutions last year calling for the state to divest from NSO. Uh, what the Treasury said is, the line we've heard many times before, which is they can't make investments based on political decisions, has to be financial reasons. Um, but there is a financial reason here. I think even before this latest escalation, um, Israel's credit rating was downgraded by Moody's over the summer. Investors were withdrawing from Israel because of its instability, because an apartheid regime is not a sound investment. It's not a sustainable investment. It is risky. And these investment funds are taking a risk with your money by continuing to put it towards this violence, um, which despite this narrative we are being sold in the US is actually not popular in the rest of the world. Israel is losing legitimacy in the rest of the world. And if, if we have to go solely on fiduciary arguments, it's not sustainable uh, to do business with a genocidal apartheid state. And now is the time right now to push for divestment. And there's no reason that it has to take years. You can start pushing for it right now. Thank you. It's, it's such an important corrective. Really, really helpful. Um, Steph, I want to ask you a little bit of a different question. So people may have noticed we both work for Jewish Voice for Peace with the same organization. I'm the digital director. So I, you know, I run the email program and the website. I've seen in real time how um, people who feel isolated when watching this stuff in a moment where they see the protests at like Grand Central Station or the Statue of Liberty, when they see there's an option, when they see there's a way to plug in, I've just seen the numbers of people coming in just explode you know it's like like exponential numbers of people that we're dealing with so going forward i think i, I guess have a question you know when as, as many 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 new people are coming into this to this uh movement through all different kinds of organizations 
what what is what are next steps look like for 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 BDS? Like what are, like where do we go from here with all of these new people that we've sort of brought into the movement? How do we get them to stay to take further action and, and to bring other people in? Um, I think that like I'm just thinking about what it's felt like to be. Um, taking collective action in the face of like the kind of historic atrocity that we are, we're not meant as human beings to be able to process tens of like 11,000 Palestinians murdered by Israel in the last month, you know, 4,500 children. I, I, we can't take it. We can't actually bear witness to it without it. It's just so it's inhuman what we're what we're experiencing and, and, and seeing. And I'm just thinking about being in these protest spaces um, and time after time here, whether we're on the, the, the Statue of Liberty and Grand Central Station and the uh, Rotunda on Capitol Hill and on freeways across the country. When we're in these spaces, I can't tell you the number of times that um, people say to me afterwards, like that was the most profound religious or spiritual experience of my life too. I think that there is something about moving in solidarity and finding community and solidarity and in movement and struggling for justice. That is like, I just want to say also like, it is both the only way we're going to actually see an end to the horrors and atrocity and violence we're seeing and the only way toward this entwined future of justice and equality and freedom. It's also like, where we find belonging and community and show up for each other. You know, it's just like, it's it's the only balm for what we see. So I just wanna say like, I feel us all experiencing that. There's so many ways in which this repressive structures we've talked about, what it actually does is like in a very racist way, demonize this movement and make it feel like, can we join, can we join? And everyone's joining right now. And it, there's this like incredible feeling of like, yes, this is home, this is community. This is where we have this fight for a shared future. And so I would just say to folks, like, follow your that gut feeling, show up to where you see that there's a path actually forward out of this horror and also where the community, we have each other, we're going to organize, we know what to do next, we know what to do next. So stay, stay with it. I think that my sense is that what it takes as organizers from here is to be, um, I do think we have to be laser focused on accomplishing ceasefire together. And as Olivia is saying, and as Omar has said, like, there's this, like, we know what's needed the day after, right? We don't let off. That's actually the moment at which we um, need to advance further campaigns, advance more and more targets that we can come together collectively around. And so I think that, like, it's about building strong organization together to show up and say, okay, we're going to fight we're going to put everything on the line there should be nothing we leave behind in this moment and together through doing that we build the kind of community and the kind of container that will allow us to fight forward and take on as olivia said the kind of build the kind of momentum to actually bring up bring bring about change we know that it feels you know as nelson mandela said it'll always feel impossible until it's done and i feel like we're in the moment where if we just stay focused um and 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 stay in the kind of organizing spaces that know how to actually advance this theory of change we know we can get it done together thanks uh omar i guess i, I want to end with you with a similar question you know obviously we're seeing uh tremendous devastation right now there's gonna be so many tasks um you know if and after a ceasefire is declared can you talk to us a little bit about uh the role that bds will play going forward and and, and yeah and what we should be doing uh, it's, it's a very difficult question because um, we always have to remember that we are doing two things at the same time. First, dealing, as, as Stephanie said, dealing with a genocide, and none of us has done this before. We have not dealt with how do you stop a genocide. Uh, we, we've dealt with companies that are complicit with, uh, so, with massacres before in Gaza, but stopping a full-fledged U.S.-Israeli genocide that's supported by powerful Western states uh, funded, armed, and, and everything else. And, and when Palestinians are so dehumanized to a level that we've not seen in, in decades to enable killing us, basically, uh, to desensitize people to the uh, scenes of our children being killed, 
uh, we have not dealt with this level of, of de racial dehumanization uh, before. So it takes its toll on you and you're reacting and you're trying to get this piece of information, process it, pass it on to convince this uh, group of uh, Hollywood artists to issue a statement to call for ceasefire, to convince this union, to convince this mass movement, this church, and so on and so forth. That takes its toll. But you always have to remember, I have to keep planting seeds for the day after. I have to prepare and escalate campaigns for the day after because accountability is what matters ultimately to stop this, to, to, to dismantle the system. Uh, Stephanie mentioned a very important point, which is our enemies are so powerful, they make it feel like it's like they're invincible. The system of oppression is invincible. You cannot beat us. So you might as well live, accept slavery as fate. That's what they try, accept oppression as fate. But you know what? The oppressed never, never, have, have never accepted oppression as fate. They will always find a way to fight it because it's not normal, it's not natural to live as oppressed. We will always seek freedom and justice and equality no matter what. We will always seek dignity and self-determination no matter what. But this invincibility uh, 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 show is a, is a matter of, deco of colonizing our minds. So what BDS is, is doing is decolonize our minds. They colonize our minds, they try, at least with despair, that we will crush you no matter what you do. We're so powerful. Israel is a nuclear uh, power. And a minister just the other day said, we, we are suggesting dropping a bomb on Gaza, a nuclear bomb on Gaza. Uh, uh, shattering the supposed uh, uh, ambiguity that Israel kept for 60 years. Uh, we're not deterred. We're not deterred. We will continue. You cannot colonize our minds because we know we are on the right path to justice and there's nothing that will stop us. So what BDS is preparing for that, as Stephanie said, we're seeing millions across the world, millions, not thousands, millions uh, that are suddenly saying, we want to do something about this. I can't keep up with the number of emails and messages I'm receiving, and that's just me. Imagine all, all of us in, in the BDS movement. What can we do you know, in a sustainable, effective way, not just to stop the genocide? We've got to make them pay the price in accountability, in real justice by dismantling the system. So we are building for that day after, at the same time that we are trying our best with all the partners and, and, and the beautiful, inspiring actions and demonstrations and, and initiatives happening all over the world. And, and it really gives us hope, but we always have to remember the other side. And just to end on, on this uh, note of uh, hope, and I, and I told Stephanie this, when I shared with uh, a, a friend, a very dear friend in Gaza, who's now suffering from beginning of starvation, basically, basically he and his wife and his two young daughters are are thirsty, are, are hungry, and, 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 and for the first time he even talks about this, but he shared that with me and he said, you know, for the first time, I can't feed my daughters. We're, we're rationing a piece of bread, basically. They have nothing, basically. Uh, but when I told him about Grand Central, I remember, that JVP just occupied Grand Central, and I, I described to him what Grand Central is in New York and so on, and that gave him so much hope so much hope because so many people in Gaza, you must have seen them on TV. The first thing they shout, is there a world out there watching us being killed? I mean, it's a televised genocide with Myanmar, with Rwanda, with, with, with Bosnia. It was never televised. We, we learned after the fact that of the uh, horrible genocide. But this is the first, the world's first televised uh, uh, genocide. People are watching it. And the U.S. is sending arms in real time while we're watching what they're doing with those weapons. Uh, um, so it's extremely difficult to maintain hope. And hope is very important, not as a romantic feeling, but to keep struggling, to keep fighting the injustice. You need that hope that you will see the light at the end of this really dark tunnel. And actions like JVP has been done, campaigns, those dock workers, wonderful dock workers in Barcelona, in Belgium, in Greece, in Turkey, that it's just... In Italy, it's, it's, it's just amazing what they're doing. The Center for Constitutional Rights serving notices to Congress uh, people, the con con Congress members that they might be held accountable, prosecutable for war crimes and possible genocide. All these legal activism, student activism, academic activism, ac economic uh, campaigns, it's all giving us hope that no, the, the world is not the superpowers and uh, the uh, the 1%, the banks and the big corporations that, that rule us, no, the people underneath that facade are with us. 
and they will continue struggling with us. That really gives us hope. Thank you, Omar. Thank you all. I, I just want to thank Omar and Olivia and Stephanie for this excellent discussion, which I, I hope can be a resource for people uh, watching and people going forward. Uh, I want to thank Haymarket for, for organizing this discussion. And I just want to make one last uh, pitch for, for what uh, the speakers all said, which is if you're looking to do something, if you're feeling alone, you're not alone, find an organization, get plugged in, because we have these moments of, of, of struggle and we want to be able to knit struggle together to struggle together and make a movement that can actually win uh, you know, justice in Palestine and justice everywhere. So thank you all. Have a good day. Thank you.